All right, Judges chapter 13. So we're starting a new, uh, a new story in the Bible here. I mean, obviously every, uh, every you know, chapter in Judges is a new story, but we're kind of entering into the introduction into one of the main um, judges or one of the judges that is talked about the most in the book of Judges in Judges chapter 13. And the Bible starts out in Judges 13, 1, where the Bible says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. So it sounds like the same story. It's like, here we go again. Right? The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. But this one's a little bit different. If you notice the next sentence, where it, or the, in the last part of the sentence, where it says, And the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines 40 years. So 40 years is a pretty long enslavement, even from you know, the history of the book of Judges that we've been looking at so far. You know, we've seen 18 years and a little bit more and a little bit less than that. But they've been enslaved in the, you know, to the Philistines because they did evil in the sight of the Lord for 40 years at this point. So look at verse number 2 where the Bible says, And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. I mean, she didn't have any children, and she apparently couldn't have any children. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And, she shall, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So let's look at what this means to be a Nazarite unto God. Um, before we get into the sermon this evening, because this comes up again and again, that this child is going to be a Nazarite unto God, which means he has certain characteristics, things that he will do and things he can't do. Uh, we'll turn to Numbers chapter 6. Now, the Nazarite uh, of God or the Nazarite from God is a vow in the Bible. But however, you know, it was a vow that a man could take um, towards God, and then he would do certain things to show that vow. But Three people in the Bible received this vow from birth, okay? Now, um, don't go to number six, or put your finger in Numbers chapter six and turn to 1 Samuel chapter one. So in the Old Testament, the two people that were Nazarites from birth, or had the Nazarite vow from birth, were Samuel and Samson. So Samson is the one we're talking about in Judges 13, and Samuel is also who we're gonna look at in 1 Samuel chapter one, look at verse 11. And this talking about Samuel's mother, where it says, And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on this affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto, unto thine handmaid a child. Again, Hannah was, uh, she was barren as well, and she just was praying to God to have a child. She says, Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. So there's the clue right there. We'll look at that in Numbers chapter 6. But we see a similar characteristic of Samuel to what we're looking at in Judges chapter 13. Now turn to Luke chapter 1. There's somebody else in the Bible that received the Nazarite vow from birth, and that is um, John the Baptist. In Luke chapter 1, look at verse 15. Look at verse 15 of Luke chapter 1 in the New Testament. So we see Samuel, we see Samson in Judges 13, and now we're going to see John the Baptist in Luke chapter 1 and verse 15 where the Bible says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Now go back to um, Numbers chapter 6, and we'll look at some of the details of the Nazarite vow. But the first thing that I want to point out with these three men that received this vow before, I mean, they didn't take the vow, they received it. You know, the Bible says, and, and the first point I want to make is that they received it from the womb. Okay, they received it from his mother's womb, it says in, in Luke chapter 1 and verse number 15. Now it says in Luke chapter 1 and verse 15, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Okay, so first, you know, notice how Luke chapter 1 and Judges 13, 5 talk about that it doesn't say from birth he will be a Nazarite. It says from the womb. Look, to be filled with the Holy Ghost, you know what you have to be? You have to be a person. Amen. You have to be a person to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now look, there are so many proofs in the Bible about 
you know, how an unborn child is an actual person, you know, that we could spend a sermon series do, looking at them all. But this is just one more. That the Nazarite vow was from the womb. Okay, this was something that, you know, if you're filled with the Holy Ghost from the womb, that was John the Baptist. And then, you know, he was a Nazarite in Judges 13 from the womb, the Bible says. Okay, it's just more proof that the personhood of the child is proved in the Bible again and again and again. Not at birth. Okay, it's also, it's also proof if you go back to Judges chapter 13, Judges chapter 13, and look, you know, at the first few verses here, the Bible says, you know, um, in verse 4, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. He's talking to, you know, Manoah's wife here. He's talking to the mother of Samson. It's also proof that, you know, what you eat, your child eats, you know, when you're pregnant. Okay, you know, what you drink, your child drinks. You know, this is why, you know, they teach against, you know, even secular med medicine teaches you shouldn't drink alcohol when you're pregnant. But look, it's, it's more, look, more people should be taking Nazarite vows today. Let me, let me tell you that, okay? I mean, there would be no fetal alcohol syndrome, all right, if, if people were taking Nazarite vows. But look at Numbers chapter 6, and let's go look at, you know, what the Nazarite vow was and the details of it, because Numbers chapter 6 and, ver and the first few verses here talk about, you know, the details of the vow. All right, so we see that there's three people that received the vow in the womb and that, you know, this proves that, you know, you're a person in the womb, okay? A, a child is a person in the womb. Look at number six and verse number one. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when either a man or a woman shall separate themselves to a vow, uh, to a vow of a Nazarite to separate themselves unto the Lord, so it could be a man or a woman, first of all, if they choose to take this vow, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation shall no razor come upon his head. Sounds familiar. Until the days be fulfilled in which he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall be holy, he shall let the locks of, his, the, head, the, of the hair of his head grow. So, I mean, this is, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So we see, and we're going to see this with Samson, that one of the outstanding, the most noticeable um, traits of the Nazarite vow is that a man would not cut his hair. Then, and, and Samson was a Nazarite from birth, from the, um, birth, from the womb, so he was never to have his hair cut. Okay, so that's the first thing. But look, this is the exception, the Bible says, for men having long hair. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You say, man, the Bible even talks about how long your hair should be? Yes, the Bible talks about everything. The Bible talks about all details of your life, including your haircut. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And there's good reason for it if we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 3. Talking about men and women and the length of their hair. So we see that the Nazarite, a person that takes a Nazarite vow, someone who's a Nazarite from the womb, is to just never cut their hair. However, look at what the Bible says for everyone else. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse number 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Verse number four. Every man. So we first see this model laid out on who, you know, as a man, who is my head? As a man, my head is Christ. As a woman, you know, the, the head of the woman is the man. So my wife's head is me. I am the head of my wife and Christ is my head. We see this model. I mean, this is a model for the family laid out elsewhere in the Bible. Nothing new here. But the Bible is relating this now to actually what's your, what is the hair on your head. Look at verse number four. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head, cover, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. So, the Bible says that every man, if a man prays or prophesies, you know, if the man is basically praying or preaching or, you know, preaching the gospel, whatever, and it is his head covered, he dishonoreth his head. So who is his head? Who's the man's head? Well, look at verse number three. His head is Christ. So it says you dishonor. If you are, you know, praying or prophesying, the Bible says, you know, 
with your head covered, you know, you dishonor Christ. I mean, this is why, I mean, you wonder where it came from where men shouldn't wear, you know, hats in buildings. This is where it came from. It's biblical, okay? I mean, you shouldn't walk into church, men, with a hat. When you walk into the building and, you know, I mean, that's where that came from. That's where that etiquette came from. Now look at verse number five. We talk about the women. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even... Uh, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. So, the Bible says if a woman's head is not covered, then she dishonoreth her head. I mean, so who is her head? Well, look back at verse number 3. The head of the woman is the man. So, the Bible here is saying that if a woman would pray or prophesy with her head uncovered, that she dishonoreth her husband, is what the Bible says. Okay, so I mean, you can start to see where there's some churches that believe in head coverings at this point, can't you? I mean, where, you know, you see these, you know, I don't know what kind of uh, churches they are, like Pentecostal, like, you know, these really strict sects of the, you know, uh, the, uh, the Amish, same thing. They must wear head coverings all the time because they're, you know, that's, this is where they're getting it, right here. Okay, however, we need to keep reading and we can see some more detail on this. Look at verse number six. The Bible goes into more about the woman, where it says, For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. So here the Bible is saying that for a woman to be shaven, for, for a woman to have her head shaved, is a shame. We'll get into that in a little bit, uh, a little bit more in, in just a few minutes. But look at now, let's skip down to verse number 14 for sake of time. And the Bible says something very interesting here in verse 14, where it says, Doth not even, don't forget this, underline these words in your Bible, especially if you go to this church. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. So what do we learn in verse 6 that's a shame unto a woman? If a woman has her head shaved, that's a shame unto her. And the Bible says that if a man has long hair, that's a shame unto him. But you say, well, you're just making that up. No, I'm not, because nature itself tells you this. Amen. Nature itself. Now, it's very important whenever you see you know, this, these words nature, natural, unnatural in the Bible, it's referring to something very specific. Look at verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory unto her. So it's kind of like the opposite of shame, right? So you have... A shaved woman is a shame unto her, and it's a dishonor to her husband. And then if she has long hair, it's a glory unto her. The opposite of shame. For her hair, uh-oh, here we go, is given to her for a covering. So that's why we don't, you know, teach and preach that women should wear head coverings in church. We do teach and preach that women should have long hair. You know, women should not have short hair. You say, why? Oh, that's legalistic. No, that's just what the Bible says. It doesn't have anything to do with going to heaven. It doesn't have anything to do, you know, with your salvation. But this is what the Bible says. I mean, you won't hear this preached anywhere. I don't know why. It's not hard to understand. But look, here's the thing. Look at verse 14 again. Doth not even nature itself. It says that this is so interesting. Because the Bible here says that nature itself teaches us this, that men should have short hair and women should have long hair. I mean, the Bible says, look, this is Romans 2.14 stuff right here. This is Romans 2.14. It says the Gentiles that, ha that have, which have not the law do by nature the things that are contained in the law. So look, Romans 2.14 is talking about the Gentiles and they did the things by nature. They didn't have the law. They did not have the law. What advantage hath the Jew? They had the oracles of God. The Gentiles who were getting the gospel preached to them, they didn't have the oracles of God. But what they were finding, and Paul's explaining, is that they did by nature the things that were in the law because God wrote the law in their hearts. Paul is explaining that. So when the Bible says that things are natural or by nature, it means that it's written in your heart, in your conscience, that God gave you. Remember our study in Romans? Everybody starts with a conscience. 
Whether you end up saved or unsaved or whatever you end up in your life, you started with a conscience. Whatever you did with it, you started with this natural law inside you. So look, that's why you're going to see, that's why you're going to see, you know, these, these, these liberal women, these feminists, the, you know, with the short hair. And in an extreme case, the completely unnatural, the homosexual woman with shaved hair. It's unnatural. It's per, it, it fits perfectly with what the Bible says. Look, I mean, you don't have to, you know, if, if, I always try to think about how to explain this to people that maybe don't read the Bible and don't come to church. But it's just, it's all about natural, natural equaling that conscience that God gave you in your heart, and unnatural meaning going against that conscience, going against that nature that God gave you in your heart. Now look, I, I interviewed my wife for this sermon. Okay, and I interviewed my wife because look, I mean, this happened. This has happened many times throughout history. Uh, just an example recently in the 40s, uh, Nazi, the Nazi Germany overtook, um, they overran France and they occupied France for, for I don't know, several years. And the, there were some women that collaborated with the enemy. I'll just leave it at that. But they collaborated with the enemy, they helped the enemy, they befriended the enemy, and uh, they were after. Germany was expelled from France. You know how they punished these women? They shaved their head. They shaved their heads. Thousands, tens of thousands of French women had their heads shorn because they collaborated with the enemy. And it was because it was a shame to them. I interviewed my wife and I said to my wife, I said, look, if somebody were to tell you that, you know, we're just going to shave your head right now, she's like, what would your feeling be? She's like, terror. She's like, my feelings would be terror because her hair is a glory unto her. And you know what? She didn't have to be taught that. That's just, that's written in her heart. I'm sure if you women in this room today could just think about somebody coming and just shaving your head completely, that's got to be, that's a terrifying thought for you. Because it's natural. It's written in your heart. And you got that natural, that natural law from the Lord. You didn't have to be taught that. The Gentiles didn't have to be taught that. So, I mean, just showing historically that, you know, it's, it's, it's a shame for a woman. You have to shut that off. Now you're saying, oh, what about a woman that, you know, someone will say, what about a woman that has cancer and goes through treatment? Or something? I mean, you know, I've known several women. I mean, first of all, the ex this exception proves the rule because I've known several women that have gone through cancer treatment and have lost all their hair. Now, first of all, that's not their fault. But look, it's, a, it's one of the hardest things that they went through as far as, as, far as that, that cancer treatment and fighting that because their hair was, a, it was, it was, it was terrifying for them to lose their hair. So they, they wore hats or they, they got, some of them got wigs, things like this, but until their hair grew back. But it was a terrifying thing. It was a sad thing for them to lose their hair in that case that was of no fault of their own. But I just want to point out that just the, the natural and unnatural um, aspects of this. Don't miss this. Look around you today, folks. I mean, look around. It explains everything that we're seeing happen today. You have to shut that off, right? And that's not the point of the sermon, but you have to, in order to, you know, you have to, you have to sear that conscience in order to not have that natural feeling anymore. So look, I just, back to the Nazarite vow, all that to say this, this man is going to stand out. Okay, people are going to know that this guy is taking a Nazarite vow because all the men have short hair. Okay, all the men have short hair except this guy who's a, a razor shall never come to his head. All right, um, that, I mean, that's terrifying to me to even think about. So on the, on, the other side, so on the other side of it, I can't even imagine something like that. But I mean, it's, 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 it's horrifying to even think about that. I mean, I remember, I mean, we're all having a hard time getting, well, most of us. Well, no, you guys are simpler on your haircuts. But I'm having a hard time getting a haircut. I mean, it's terrible having your hair, you know, grow out long. I mean, for a man, right? Because it's a natural thing. It's not natural for a man to have long hair, okay? Look, Numbers chapter 6, look at verse number 6 just to finish this off. All the days that he separateth himself unto the Lord. So just remember, he's separated unto the Lord as well. He's got these specific rules, but he's separated unto the Lord. He shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die. Meaning, 
if somebody in his family dies, this guy can't carry the body. All right, because the consecration of God is upon his head. Okay, because like, who's his head? Again, his head is Christ. Okay, look, um, it's a voluntary separation from the Lord as a sacrifice to God. That's what the Nazarite vow taken by a normal man was, and that's what Numbers chapter 6 is explaining. Now, of course, Samson is going to be a Nazarite from the womb, a very special case. There was only three of them in the Bible. Judges chapter 13, let's go back there, look at verse number 6. I'm going to hurry up here. Uh, Judges chapter 13, look at verse number 6. The Bible says that when the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him not, from, I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. She, asked, she said, I didn't ask him whence means where you came from. She said, I didn't ask him where he came from. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine or strong drink, neither any, eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, there it is again, to the day of his death. I mean, look, I mean, I'm sorry, but I mean, I mean, just, why can't we just listen to the Bible? The Bible's so simple. I mean, there's few things that are proven so many times in the Bible that a child is a person from the womb. You know, I mean, why can't we just follow the Bible in this country? I mean, don't you think things would be simpler and better that way? But no, let's just go ahead and let's just murder 50 million people. Let's murder 50 million people. And let's see how that works out for us. It's probably 60 million now. I mean, who knows? I mean, look, it's, it's so simple. I mean, you know what? It's so simple that a child would be a person from the womb. That makes perfect sense. It goes straight with the Bible, what it says here and in many other places. But look, it's so simple that, that what is, you know, that, that Ms. Crisol and Ms. Viviana, they are pregnant with a person. You know what's complicated? You know what's complicated? Is proving how that's not a person. That's complicated. I mean, science itself shows you that when, you know, at fertilization, that you have a whole new genetic code, code. You have a whole, you know, third genetic situation there. DNA that's all unique, everything. You know what's complicated is trying to find another point in the growth of a child where he becomes or he she becomes a person other than at conception. That's what's complicated. You know, it's just like how compromise in general is complicated. You know, sticking to the Bible is just simple. Amen. Sticking to the Bible is simple. You just, I mean, it's just, it's just the Bible. It's not hard to explain. It's not hard to understand. It's just the Bible. I mean, these are people. I mean, we're literally murdering tens of millions of people in this country. 55, 60 million people. I mean, look, that, that's what's going to bring this country down, right there, that one thing. I mean, innocent blood like that, it, I mean, read the Bible. It never goes unanswered by God. Judgment's coming for that. We should have just listened. We should just listen to the Bible. All right, back to the sermon. Verse number 8. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again into us and teach us what we shall do to the child that be born. And, the God heart, and God hearkened unto the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto her, him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art, art thou the man that speaketh unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child? And how shall we do unto him? He's like, tell me what we're supposed to do with this child. You know, she must not have told him, you know, the whole story because he wants to hear it himself. Look at verse number 13. And the angel repeats himself. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, this is a patient angel, of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that come of, cometh of the vine, neither drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread, and if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew, that he was an, knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. So, I mean, first of all, this is another proof in the Bible that angels, angels are messengers of God, and many times, especially this case here, they look like people. 
They look like, I mean, the Bible says that, you know, we may entertain angels unawares. Well, how is that possible? Because they look like us. Because angels are sent to earth and they can look just like a person, just like this person. I mean, Manoah didn't know that this was an angel. The Bible says the angel of the Lord said on Manoah, but the Bible just said at the end of verse 16, Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. And the angel just also understand that he doesn't want the sacrifice for himself. He did not want them worshiping him. He wanted the sacrifice to go to God. Look at verse 17. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? That when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? Well, why in the world is his name secret? Well, I mean, look at the verse previously. I mean, his name is secret because if he would have given him his name, they would have worshipped him. <laughs> I mean, it's like people just will just worship anything. I mean, especially these people. But he's like, I don't, you know, my name's secret. You know, it's probably Gabriel. That's my thought. You know, from Luke 1, 26, you know, Gabriel talked to Mary. You know, I have nothing to back that up, but my opinion is that this is quite possibly Gabriel. But look, he didn't want to give his name. He said, my name is secret, and, you know, I don't want you to do me honor. I'm here to deliver a message. These angels are there to do a job. That's it. And look at uh, verse 19. So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto who? The angel? No, unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously. What's that mean? Turn to Judges chapter 6. And the angel did wondrously, and Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came to pass, when the flame went up towards heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar, and Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. Now they know something's up. Look at Judges 6 and verse number 20. This is similar to what happened to Gideon with the angel. And the angel of God said unto him, in verse 20 of Judges 6, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and lay them upon this rock, and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand, and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes, and there arose up fire out of the rock, and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. The angel did the same thing in Judges chapter 13. He did miraculously. That means he burnt the offering himself. He started the fire himself. And then in Judges 13, he not only started the fire, but he went up to heaven in the flame of the fire. And now Manoah knows this just isn't a guy. Okay, in Judges chapter, you know, it's the same fire, same type of situation. Look at verse 21. And the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah, turn to Exodus 33, and Manoah said unto his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. Turn to Exodus chapter 33. So where is he getting that? Well, it was a common thing in Israel to know that, you know, if you looked upon God, you were not going to live through that. And here's why. Look at Exodus chapter 33 and verse number 20. God is talking to Moses, and God says that he's going to show himself to Moses. But God says to Moses, he says, hey, when I show myself, I'm going to reveal myself to you. But when God walks by him, God puts his hand, uh, covers his face, so only Moses can only see his back. So God, you know, doesn't kill Moses, okay? Because look at Exodus chapter 33 and verse 20. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. So you cannot look upon God the Father, his face, and live through that, the Bible says. Okay, that's what he says um, to Moses, and that's what Manoah, that's that information, that knowledge, that Manoah just thinks he just saw God. Okay, and he's like, you know, we're going to die. But his wife said unto him, verse 23, If the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have received the burnt offering and a meat offering at our hands. Neither would he have showed us these things, nor would at this time have told us such things as these. So, I mean, this is a logical woman right here. Okay, this is a logical woman. So, first of all, I want you to remember that, you know, God received this offering from them. And God doesn't just receive any old offering. God doesn't receive any offering that you could think of at any time, you know, whatever you want to give him, okay? But she says to him, she's like, look, if he was going to kill us, he wouldn't have received our offering, okay? And then the Bible ends this chapter where it says, and the, women, and the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. So here we see the beginning of the story of Samson 
in the Bible. So we're going to get into the story of Samson um, next week, but for now I want to just apply this Nazarite vow and what this can mean for us in our lives today. Turn to Romans chapter 12. What can we learn from the Nazarite vow of the Old Testament? Look at Romans chapter 12 and look at verse number 1. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. The Nazarite vow and you is what we're going to talk about now. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. The Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So the Bible here is saying, you know, that we should, you know, present our bodies themselves as a sacrifice unto God, meaning that they should be holy. You know, if they're holy, they're going to be acceptable unto God, implying that there's an unacceptable sacrifice, by the way. Again, implying that. Okay, now look, look at verse number two. And be not conformed to this world. There's that separation that we always talk about. But the opposite of, the opposite of being conformed to this world is be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So here the, the Bible is saying that our bodies themselves are to be presented as a sacrifice to God, that we are to be separate. Look, there's some interesting details of the Nazarite vow. If we look back at Numbers chapter 6 and verse number 2, I'll just read it for you. But the Bible says this in, in Numbers chapter 6, 3, He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. Being a Nazarite, having that Nazarite vow is much about separation from things. Okay? And, you know, whether a man... Um, or women shall separate themselves to a vow, to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord. The Nazarite vow was all about separation. It was all about separation. The same thing that we're seeing in Romans chapter 12. Verse 4 of number 6 says, All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernels even unto the husk. Look, he's to be separate. And very specifically, he's to separate from wine and strong drink. But then notice the extremes of the Nazarite vow. You know, he's not only to not have strong drink, but he's to have no vinegar. He's to have no liquid at all that comes from grapes. Like no grape juice. No grape juice for Samson. You're like, oh man. Look, he's not even supposed to eat grapes. Or, or dried grapes. You're like, what? You can't even have raisins? Who would want to eat a raisin anyway? What? I mean, it should be against the law to make cookies with raisins in them. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> what were we talking about? I mean, the worst thing in the world is when you think you get a chocolate chip cookie and it's a raisin cookie. It's like, ah! Nazarite vow. Look. I'm trying to point out the extremes here, okay? No raisin cookies. And it all goes back to that, you know, anything of the vine. Nothing to eat of the vine, nothing to drink, no grape juice, no Capri Sun, nothing. No fruit juice, nothing that comes from the vine. Or the husk. You know, you can also make alcohol from corn. We had an ethanol plant attached to the power plant that I used to work at. Millions and millions and millions of gallons of straight alcohol from corn. That's what it's talking about from the husk. Alcohol is made also from that. Look, this shows, us, this shows us two things that we can take from the Nazarite vow. First of all, our body is to be a sacrifice, number one. And our body, we are to be separate, number two. So we see those two things. So what can we learn from that? Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 22. I'm going to show you two things that you can personally learn from the Nazarite vow. I mean, your body is supposed to be a sacrifice unto God, and you are supposed to be separate from the world unto God. Very similar to the Nazarite vow. You're pretty much living the Nazarite vow if you're following the Bible, folks. Now look at 1 Thessalonians 5.22. This is the first lesson right here. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Look, he's not even supposed to be in a, in a vineyard. He's not supposed to touch a grape. I mean, that, I mean, 
That's pretty good. I mean, look, he, if, 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 you're not suppo- if you took this vow and you're not supposed to have strong drink, but you're constantly walking around in vineyards all the time, you know, I mean, th- you know, that could have an appearance of evil. The Bible says abstain from even the appearance of evil. Listen to that advice. Look, you say, but I, I don't drink. Well, then don't go, don't go to bars. Amen. Don't go to bars. Stay away from places that may even give you the appearance that you that may give the appearance that you're involved in sin. Any place like that. Look, I mean, this goes back to, you know, secrets are always bad. Look, if you wouldn't want anyone seeing that you're there or knowing that you're there, you shouldn't be there. Amen. That's a good rule of thumb. And the second thing is this. Keep yourself protected from sin. Keep yourself protected from sin. Identify, look, identify the weak points in your life. You know the weak points in your life. Your weak points may not be my weak points, and my weak points may not be your weak points, but you personally know your weak points. If you struggle with alcohol, just an example, don't go to places that sell alcohol. Don't even put that in front of you. Stay as far away from it as possible. Look, this is why if you quit drinking and you have a problem with alcohol and you quit drinking, you need new friends. You can't be around a bunch of friends that drink. It's, it's not going to work. You have to get far away from that, just like the Nazarite was far separated from alcohol. You need to put protections in place for your weak points to protect yourself against sin. Do a self-assessment. You know, find out what you struggle with. You struggle with, you struggle with covetousness. You know, uh, you struggle with gambling. You know, don't go to casinos. Don't go anywhere near them. If you struggle with that type of thing. I mean, look, I mean, a lot of people don't struggle with any of this stuff. And that's great. But if you do, you have to put protections in place. If you struggle with pornography, which apparently a lot of people in this country do, you know, put protections in place. We talked about how you can protect yourself from, you know, the devices in your home and you can monitor things and you can watch out, you know, from your, with your kids. Look, get, it, get extreme. Get rid of your internet access if you have to. Whatever it takes. You say, what? Look, these things, these, these sins, they will destroy your future. They'll destroy your future. Romans 12 is telling us that our bodies are to be a living sacrifice to God. Acceptable to God. Cain and Abel, we know that not every sacrifice is acceptable. You know, God just doesn't accept anything. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. You see, keeping yourself from sin is, is more about, you know, it, it's more than just avoiding chastisement of God. It's much more than just that. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. I mean, it's, it's much more than just avoiding punishment from God. It's about providing an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. Look at Hebrews 12, 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? So God loves you. You're saved. You know, it's, it's, it's really not a question of whether or not God loves you. It's a question of, you know, do you love him? is what it's a question of. But look, you're saved. You're going to get chastised by God if you don't do any of the things that I'm telling you to do. That's just what's going to happen. But some people will just be beaten their whole life. So it's much more than just avoiding chastisement from God. Look, our bodies, are, are, you, are you hearing me? Our bodies are sacrificed to God. Are, I mean, are you a pile of trash? Are you a pile of garbage to God? I mean, is your life just this burning dumpster fire. Here's my sacrifice, God. A big dumpster that's on fire right now. And it smells so bad you can't even get within 50 feet of it. I mean, is that, is that your sacrifice? Here you go, God. Thanks for eternal life. I mean, God's not going to take away your eternal life. And that's the sacrifice that you offer him. You know, I offer you in return just this junky life. Just this junk-filled life because I won't listen to a thing that you say is basically what, what, that's your sacrifice you say you know but you know it, all the answers are in the Bible you're like nah I don't like to read that's nine chapters a day ah 
I mean, are you kidding me? I have to spend half an hour a day reading the Bible? <sighs> you know what? People like this, and I don't know how to convince you, but people like this just have no character. That's the answer. They just have no character. If you have somebody that's done everything for you, given you eternal life, you're going to go to heaven, and you're just going to offer just this garbage to the Lord. And not only, not only are you going to offer the garbage to the Lord, when He gives you, he gives you all the answers to unwind all that garbage. He gives you a church to go to. He gives you uh, brothers and sisters in Christ to be around. And you're just like, nope, I'll be in the dumpster. Lighting myself on fire. I mean, you've got to, it's, a, it's a character problem. It's a character problem. If you know somebody like this, it's a character problem. They have no character. That's, that's the issue. You know, think about it. They get saved... They get in church for five seconds and they fizzle out. And it, I mean, it's pitiful. Amen. It's pitiful. It's hard to watch. And you can truly say, look, you can truly say that people like this will succeed at nothing right. in their life. Why? How could I possibly say that? How could I possibly say that? Because look, if you won't make the effort, if you won't make the effort to be a proper sacrifice with your life and your body, I mean, think about this. If you won't make the effort to be the proper sacrifice with your life and your body to the one God that has given you everything, you will do it for no one. So, I mean, you can see, you can see the disaster that this will lead people to. And, I mean, They'll, you'll never make a serious effort at anything else. The one thing, I mean, you should see, you would think you would see people, and you do see people like this, where they do make a serious effort to be a proper sacrifice, and then they have a lot of other problems in other places. But at least they got the one thing, the main thing, the most important thing, squared away. They're having a hard time getting everything else squared away. They're working on those things, and hey, those things will fall together. The main thing's got to come first. Because look, if you won't do, if you won't do, if you won't open the directions and follow, I mean, if you love me, keep my commandments. Look, I mean, he loves us, so he gave us the commandments. Amen. But yet he says in a humble way, if you love me, keep my commandments. But think, he gave us the commandments because he loves us. So we can be that proper sacrifice. I mean, if you won't start there. You're gonna, you have no chance anywhere else. It's, it's terrible. It's, it's terrible that people don't understand this. I mean, is this complicated? Is this hard to understand? This is not hard to understand, folks. This is not Christianity, you know, 420. You know, this is, this is getting your life together and, and loving the Lord 101 is what we're talking about here. So, that's how, you know, the Nazarite vow... Is, is the same as us. It's the same as us. We're to be separate. The Nazarite vow in Numbers chapter 6 is just separate, 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 separate. We're to be separate. Amen. And it's about offering a sacrifice. And guess what? We're the sacrifice. We're the offering to God. It's never going to be enough. It's never going to be enough. And it's never about our salvation or working to heaven or anything. Look, our salvation was a gift. It's about loving the Lord. And it's about having that acceptable sacrifice to God. It's a character issue. Through and through. That's all it is. That's all it is. Because honestly, the chastisement, you'll watch people, you'll watch people just get beaten into the ground by God their whole life. And they'll just be like, you know, they'll just be on the ground just getting kicked and kicked and kicked and they're just like, whatever. But, I mean, you'd think you love the Lord. I don't know. You'd think you love your family. I don't know. I don't get it. So next week, we begin the story of Samson in the Bible. One of the most interesting judges in the Bible. I, I mean, pro, the most interesting. I'm just going to say it, okay? The most interesting judge in the Bible. A ton to learn from Samson. You know, it's a true, look, it's a true biblical story. It's a true biblical story of potential energy. You know what potential energy is? You know, actual kinetic energy is your car driving down the road. Potential energy is a, is a massive 
five-ton rock sitting on a cliff that, that could have a lot of energy if someone pushed it off the cliff. Could have a lot of energy if somebody put it into motion, rolling down the hill or whatever. But Samson is a true story in the Bible of potential energy. And we're going to look at it in the coming weeks. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.